the Sacramento Kings can just not get out of their own way. Um, you know, last week they end up firing the, oddly enough, the second best coach in Sacramento Kings history, obviously the Kings are, uh, you know, have pretty long history, but not so much in Sacramento, you know, from the time they've been there, Rick Adelman was by far their most successful coach. And then Luke Walton, hilariously enough, uh, second best coach in Kings history, uh, Sacramento Kings history, at least by win percentage. Um, yeah, I was I was laughing hysterically when I saw that. That's just something you can't feel good about if you're a Kings fan. Um, always had a soft spot for this team. Obviously, the Heat are always are always going to be my first love. Um, but I'm always pulling for the Kings. I just want them to be better than they are. It was really fun, like in the early 2000s when they were good. Um, you know, I think Sacramento has some really good sports fans there. You know, and I would like to see the team do a little bit better for them, or at least stiff a little bit of success. Um, they really don't have any issues with the decision of firing Luke Walton. It just kind of never happened for him here, uh, and it never looked quite right. Um, you know, as far as him as a head coach, you know, it, it looked like it, he, you know, he could be a really good head coach, you know, during his time with the Warriors when he was the head coach, at least on an interim basis, while Steve Kerr was having some health issues. It looked really good. Um, but Hindsight wise, it looks like maybe the roster was kind of carting him along rather than him keeping the ship afloat with Kerr out. Uh, goes to the Lakers, never really looks good there, never really happens. Then he goes to the Kings, same story. Um, so decision wise, I definitely think they made the right decision. Uh, it's the timing of it that's just really weird to me. So um, last season, obviously a huge disappointment for the Kings. They expected to be in a play in game or, you know, at least that was the kind of the goal they had in mind. I think that that was a realistic goal and they didn't attain it. And it's just not looked good under Walton. So they bring him back to start this year to the chagrin of myself and I'm sure a lot of the Kings fan base. Um, but now here we are less than a fourth of the way into the season. They fired him like, OK, if you were feeling that uncertain about his future as the coach of this team, why bring him back at all? Like you could have, if you had fired him, you know, after the season, you could have been interviewing candidates all off season and brought in the right guy or somebody you feel really strongly about leading this thing in the right direction. I guess you could argue that like, given their history, they typically don't make the right decision. But like, if you give them the benefit of the doubt and think they're, they're going to make a competent decision, like why would you bring him back at all if he was on this short of a leash? It's just weird. So now you've got Alvin Gentry taking over, which is like, you know, he career wise, 510 wins, 595 losses. At least when I grab that number, it's changed a little bit now because he's had a couple of games um, coaching the Kings. I think he, you know, might be 512 wins to 595 losses now, something like that. Anyways, not, not great, but not horrible. Um, and so far, at least, you know, I know they're, you know, they had it, the, the, the good win against the Portland Trailblazers and that triple overtime thriller against the Lakers. Um, but the first game under him was really rough. It didn't appear to have the Nate McMillan effect that he had on the Hawks that McMillan had on the Hawks last year, where he kind of got the, got the thing going after uh, they fired Lloyd Pierce. Um, Cause th that first game that, uh, Gentry coached was rough. It was against the 76ers, and you're like, oh, the 76ers, that's a good team. Uh, well, they were without Embiid, Tobias Harris, Seth Curry, and obviously Ben Simmons. So you're talking about um, the Sacramento Kings at full strength versus the Philadelphia 76ers backup crew plus Tyrese Maxey. Um, and they lost. I mean, Embiid looked like Shaq or Will Chamberlain out there. I think he had something like 26 rebounds in that game. So didn't inspire a lot of confidence that this was going to really drastically change under Gentry. I guess if you're feeling optimistic, you know, he's a coach who's been around a really long time. He's had some success and um, maybe the guys in the locker room will respect him because he's, you know, been around for such a long time. So he could, he could get this ship righted, but I, I just, I don't think long term wise, I just can't see him being the solution here. Um, yeah. So as I kind of mentioned, Adelman, most uh, successful coach in the Sacramento Kings history. 
um, and arguably, you know, maybe Kings as a whole, but I, I wouldn't say that, but I think he's certainly in the mix. Um, so they decide to not re- just kind of, I'm going to kind of go back through history now and at least touch on kind of the draft mistakes to kind of illustrate how this team just doesn't get out of their own way ever. Um, and that will kind of give some context to why this has to be so frustrating for them. So they don't bring Adelman back after the 2006 season. That was a season in which they made the playoffs. So they decide not to renew his contract. Uh, haven't been back to the playoffs since. Haven't even finished a by f- above 500 since they didn't bring Adelman back. So from 2006 on now, this team has not finished above 500. I'm not sure that this team can finish above 500 or make the playoffs this year. Maybe they can sneak into the playoff spot if everything goes really well for them. Um, So as I kind of mentioned, let's kind of go back through, you know, some draft picks that they've made um, during that time. So 2007, they have the 10th pick that takes Spencer Hawes. Thad Young was available around that time. Uh, They would have been better off with Thad Young, but whatever. Spencer Hawes had a long career. It's not really too egregious of a pick. 2008, they do decently, I guess, and they get the 12th pick in the draft. They take Jason Thompson. Could have had Roy Hibbert, Robin Lopez. Jason Thompson, from what I remember, was pretty solid. So, again, we haven't done anything too crazy yet. Um, some of the Kings misery, at least drafting wise, they've kind of always been on the outside looking in or like one pl- a player has gone, you know, right before them. That would have really changed the, you know, the scope of their franchise. Um, and, and, and then also they just make some really horrible drafting decisions in some of these years. Um, so they take Tyreek Evans in 2009, they take him fourth. Um, James Harden goes third in that draft, so they just missed out on him. Uh, Steph Curry goes seventh. Um, In defense of the Tyreek Evans pick, he had one of the best rookie years we've ever seen from a player. Uh, Starting at point guard for them, he averaged 25 and five, so 20 points, five rebounds, five assists. Um, At the time, only LeBron, Oscar Robinson, and MJ had done that as rookies. Now Luka Doncic also is in that category. Um, So you're looking at some really, you know, generation defining players who have done that. Uh, And then there's Tyreek Evans. Uh, I really liked him, um, maybe to a fault, Um, but he just never got a defined role with them. And like the first year he started at point guard, it looked really good. And then from then on, they're like, oh, well, we want him at shooting guard. We want him at small forward. We want him doing this. We want him doing that. And he just, they just really messed with his head. It looked like, and he regressed and he kind of just never took the next step forward after that rookie season. And I think it's just because, you know, he had a couple of different coaches and they just never defined his role. So they kind of squandered that potentially generational type uh, talent. Um, I guess we'll never know Uh, if he had gone somewhere else, maybe things would have been different for him. Um, So 2010, they take DeMarcus Cousins fifth great pick there. Hassan Whiteside in the second round. Weird to take two centers in the same draft, but, you know, whatever. It worked out for them. Uh, Whiteside never really did anything for them. Uh, Bounced around the G League and overseas and ended up, uh, Miami ended up giving him a chance. Um, So, so far, so good. You know, Tyreek Evans, DeMarcus Cousins, looking really good here. Um, So, in 2011, this is when things start to get a little weird. Um, they take Bismack Biombo with the seventh pick in the draft and decide to trade that down to take Jimmer for debt. Um, so they just to give you an idea of who they could have had, uh, they could have taken Kemba Walker ninth, Clay Thompson 11th, Kawhi Leonard 15th, Vucevic 16th, Tobias Harris 19th, um, Jimmy Butler 30th. Uh, They did draft Isaiah Thomas that draft with the 60th pick. So mystery relevant really came through for them. It turned out to be a really good player. Um, The Clay Thompson thing, obviously taking Jimmer over him in hindsight is pretty egregious. Even at the time, there were a lot of people, myself included, who didn't believe in Jimmer for dead at the next level. He just didn't have, he was kind of a little too small and just not quite athletic enough to get it done. And and at the NBA level, he's obviously killing it in China. Um, but that doesn't help the Kings. Kawhi Leonard, that may seem really low for him. Um, but at the time, he was kind of unskilled, didn't really have a jump shot. He was a power forward, from what I remember, at San Diego State. And people weren't really sure what to make of him. Once he got into San Antonio, he really just developed like crazy. Like, we, I don't think anybody at the time would have seen him developing 
um, the skill set and just the, you know, the, he's one of the most skilled players in the league now. And I don't think you would have seen that ever happening at the time. Um, but the clay Thompson, uh, you know, not selecting clay Thompson or Kemba Walker in that range, just really bad. Just really not great. Um, 2012, it doesn't get any better. They take Thomas Robinson fifth Bradley Beal goes third in that draft. So, you know, maybe if the ping pong balls go differently for them, they could have had that. Uh, Damian Lillard is the sixth pick and Harrison Barnes is the seventh pick. Um, yeah, that's a tough pill to swallow, particularly with the Damian Lillard one. Barnes is really good for them now. So they ended up with him later down the road. But yeah, Thomas Robinson, it just never did anything. The league kind of moved away from players like him, you know, undersized power forwards who are kind of unskilled. Um, that was when kind of the league shifted to small ball. Um, and it just it just never really worked out for him. Uh, 2013, they take Ben McLemore, who, you know, it didn't work out. But I think it was more the Kings not doing a great job of developing players than him because he had elite talent. Um, some, you know, struggles character wise, at least going into that draft. He seems to have kind of cleaned up his act, at least in the league. Um, Giannis goes 15th in that draft. I had kind of mentioned during the Pelicans video, Giannis was 6'8 and like, you know, razor thin entering the draft. We would have never expected him to be pushing six foot and just the, the Hulk of a human being that he is today, at least going into that draft. It's very rare that like 18, 19 year old kids hit like a huge growth spurt um, after they enter the league. So not going to kill them too much for the, for the not selecting Giannis. Obviously that would have really changed the, the scope of their franchise. Um, 2014, they take Nick Stauskas eighth which is uh, really rough. Could have had Julius Randle at seven if they had ping pong balls had gone differently. Uh, Zach Levine went 13th. I think um, kind of like I had mentioned with Ben McLemore, the development thing. So if, had they taken Levine, I think it would have worked out similarly as Ben McLemore, just because they had, you know, in, in terms of like skill set as like a draft prospect, they're very similar, um, you know, super athletic, sort of raw, shooting guard or, or wing type players um, that could shoot the three. Like they're, they're both kind of cut from that cloth. Levine, I think it worked out to his benefit that he didn't end up in Sacramento. Um, later picks in that draft, Jeremy Grant, Spencer Dinwiddie, and Jokic was a second rounder. Can't really kill them too much for not taking Jokic. Um, Would have probably been a weird fit. Uh, with DeMarcus Cousins anyways. Um, but this is when things really start to go sideways for them. Uh, 2015, they take Willie Cauley-Stein with the sixth pick in the draft. So they have DeMarcus Cousins, who at this point, you know, franchise-defining center. You know, I don't know if he had made an all-star team yet, but he's, he's certainly in the mix for that. Um, you know, one of the best centers in the league at that stage in his career, and they take a center with the sixth pick in the draft, you know, DeMarcus Cousins during his time with the Kings never played with another all-star, like at least a, a all-star that was a king that was on the team with him. Um, so yeah, drafting a bunch of centers doesn't really help that, uh, 13th pick in that draft was Devin Booker. So that one really hurts. Um, 2016, they have the eighth pick seventh pick was Jamal Murray. Uh, they end up trading down, and this this is just a complete debacle for them in 2016. Um, Sabonis was on the board, Lavert, Siakam, Dejounte Murray, Malcolm Brogdon, Zubac was a second round pick. Um, so they trade down from their from their eighth pick. I'm sorry, they had the eighth pick. Jamal Murray was the seventh pick. Um, so they trade down from their eighth spot. They get 13 and 28. Pick 13 and 28. Um, so they give up on the chance to draft Marquise Chris, uh, not really losing anything there. But they take Georgios Papagiannis, who was – I couldn't find a mock draft with him any better than like the 58th pick in the draft um, or undrafted was a lot of them. So they move down, and they, with their lottery pick, they take a guy who – may not even get drafted that year. And then they take Scal Lubissier, who is kind of a power forward center, kind of a weird player. Um, so DeMarcus Cousins is probably on his hands and knees, like just pleading for the <laughs> Vladi Divac, Divac, the GM, to bring him some help. And he's like, no problem, fam, I got you. Uh, I'm going to take two centers here after we took a center last season 
also. Just crazy. Just crazy. Uh, so they end up giving up uh, on the Cousins thing, trade him to New Orleans. 2017, they're terrible. Uh, they take De'Aaron Fox. Pretty good pick. Um, also could have had uh, either Donovan Mitchell or Bam Adebayo. Um, but just to give them some credit here, uh, De'Aaron Fox, uh, they could have had uh, Jonathan Isaac, Lowry Markin, and uh, Frank Nitakina and Dennis Smith. Those were the next guys selected after Fox. So good job. They didn't completely blow it uh, in 2017. 2018, completely different story. They completely blow it. Um, so I've read, they, they take Marvin, Marvin Bagley with the second pick. Uh, Luka Doncic, third pick in that draft. Jaron Jackson Jr., uh, fourth pick. Trey Young, fifth pick. So they did about as poorly as they could have done, you know, given with a top five pick. I guess they could have picked somebody that's already out of the league, but not going to give them any credit for not taking Marvin Bagley in terms of if anybody doesn't remember narratively what was going on. Uh, Doncic was MVP of the Euro League uh, at 18 years old, which had like never been done, I don't think. Um, so Doncic was an obvious slam dunk pick. People had talked about him even going first above Aiton. And if he had been selected first, nobody would have batted, batted an eye. Um, but instead, because I, I've read that Divots had issues with Luka Doncic's dad from when they were playing professional ball overseas, uh, that was why he didn't take Doncic. Well, you really showed him like he, he didn't have to play for Sacramento and yeah, so didn't really work out there for them. Um, and that kind of brings us to today. They've kind of nailed the last two picks, it looks like, with Halliburton and Mitchell. But, yeah, a, a lot of those picks were just complete disasters um, at best and, like, weird fits on also complete disasters at worst. Um, they did have some solid picks in there, but I'm not going to give them too much credit because there were some really, really weird decisions made in there. Um, so I, I think, you know, to kind of go into their future here of whether or not they should blow this thing up or, um, you know, kind of try and retool and make a playoff push. I'm kind of leaning towards retool. Um, a lot of the guys, at least in Fox's case, who's kind of their franchise guy, he's still pretty young. So there's no reason to like you know, completely tear this thing down. I think the current GM, um, you know, he may be leaning in that direction, at least with what they've drafted, it looks that way. But both Mitchell and Halliburton just kind of fell in their lap. So it's not like he was targeting guards necessarily in the draft. It was more of, you know, you could make the case that he was just trying to take the best player available. Um, but he didn't draft De'Aaron Fox, so he may want to move off of that. Um you know, in, in terms of what Alvin Gentry is doing with the roster, at least in the games that I've watched, I think he's a lot closer to getting kind of the puzzle pieces together than Luke Walton does, um, or Luke Walton did. If you remember the scene from Idiocracy where he's doing the IQ test and they're, they're trying to do like the, that baby um, puzzle where you just put the, the shaped blocks into the correct slot, um, Luke Walton was sitting there crying with you know, all the blocks in front of him. Um, whereas, you know, Gentry, at least thus far, you know, he's gotten a couple of blocks into the slots, but there's still some that he's trying to jam into weird. And, and he, you know, it looks like he's trying to jam the star piece into the circle slot um, for some of the things that he's doing. But for the most part, he's, he's doing better. Um, I, I, I guess. Yeah. It, it, there's a lot of players that I like on this team. I like, I like De'Aaron Fox. I like Buddy Heald. I like Halliburton. Like I like Davion Mitchell, um, Harrison Barnes, Rashawn Holmes, and Marvin Bagley. So they've got, you know, seven guys that, you know, I think most NBA fans are like, yeah, I like that player. You know, maybe not to carry a franchise, but, you know, they're, they're not, you know, to have seven guys that are like real NBA players, like that's, that's more than the Washington Wizards have had over the past few years. This year is obviously different, but, you know, in terms of guys who belong on an NBA roster, they've got a lot of them. Um, yeah, if they do decide to retool um, the team, I think De'Aaron Fox, you know, a decent two or three option um, on like a championship style team. I don't think he's ever going to be the guy to lead a team to the finals um, in terms of how they should be using him. I think getting him off the ball a little bit more um, could be really beneficial, at least on the fast break. I mean, this dude has special, special athletic ability. I have to imagine he's the fastest player in the league and it, it may not be close. He's at least top three, 
I can't think of anybody off the top of my head who would be faster than him. Um, and he's been pretty good at finishing around the basket. He's got some shooting touch. Um, I think if they want to use him and really, you know, unlock him as a weapon, um, I think, I don't think he needs to be bringing the ball up on the fast break. I think Monte Ellis is a really interesting comparison for him. You know, Ellis was kind of an undersized two guard. And I think if they use Fox like that, I think he could be really good. You know, Monte Ellis, electric speed when he was in the league. I mean, he was the fastest guy in the league there for a while. Good at finishing on the fast break. And, you know, like Ellis, when Fox gets going downhill in a one-on-one -on -one situation on a fast break, basically unguardable. So, you know, if they if they get him to just release on shots instead of hanging around the basket and trying to get the outlet pass, I think he could be lethal on the fast break for them. Um, and then in the half court, yeah, they keep doing what they're doing with him. Pick and rolls, good, good option for him. And Gentry also has this play that I really like where he starts on the right side of the court. Fox is a left-handed player, starts on the right side of the court. And they just sprint him in like a banana cut around the arc. And he gets a double screen, catches the ball, and just all his momentum is going towards the basket. There's very few people who are going to be able to keep up with him or, or make a contest on a play like that if they don't cover it right, you know, right from the start. So that's something that they can continue to exploit. And then pick and roll wise, I mean, he's a matchup nightmare for a big, you know, the shooting, shooting stuff is down this year, but if he can get, get it to back it back where it was last year, percentage wise, I think they're, that's going to be fine. Um, Monte Ellis was the same story. The shooting was never quite where you wanted it to be. But I mean, it's still something that as a defender, you can't sag off of him um, for fear of him going to the basket because he he will knock down the three. Um, Halliburton, another guy really like and I really like his fit with Fox in the backcourt. Um, he's a really unconventional guard. Uh, it's really it's it's not like something I've really seen. Um, and it's not something you can just be like, OK, we're just going to run pick and roll to death with Halliburton. I think that would be he can do it and he can do it pretty successfully. Um, but I think that would be misusing his skill set um, and not unlocking his potential fully. Um, he is a special, special passer and playmaker. He has really good vision. He makes really good decisions and he's really accurate, accurate with the ball when he makes those decisions. Um, doesn't have a lot of shake off the dribble. Like he's not going to be able to break down a lot of guys off the dribble and get around them. Um, in terms of speed, it's not anything super special. Um, and then just dribble moves wise, it's just, he's never going to be getting around guys. And a lot of times they'll run like just really traditional pick and rolls with him I don't think that that's the best way to use him um yeah he, he's just not as well suited to kind of set up the pick and roll and really capitalize off of it um his shot is a little unconventional it looks a lot like Sean Marion's but it goes in a lot more and it looks better than Sean Marion's but just it's kind of funky like Marion's was um, but he, he knocks the threes down. I mean, he's a really good, accurate three point shooter. Um, but the mechanics of his shot, kind of like I mentioned with him not being well suited to take, you know, do a more traditional pick and roll. He's not going to be able to hit the step backs that we see guys hitting today. His mechanics just don't make that possible for him to do. Um, so he's not gonna, ever going to be a really great off the dribble shooter at, or on the move shooter, at least if his mechanics continue as the way they are. And he has no reason to change him. I mean, catch and shoot wise, he he's able to knock down threes at a pretty good clip. Um, yeah, I think, you know, kind of like I had mentioned with getting Fox off the ball, at least on the fast break a little bit more, it looks like uh, Gentry is moving more towards this where he's having Halliburton lead the fast break and Halliburton kind of push the tempo. I think that's a really good fit for him, especially with Fox, where who, who you can get him down the court as quickly as possible, and he doesn't have to worry about getting the outlet pass and leading the break. Halliburton is a much better passer than Fox, and so he's able to hit guys with those lead passes, kind of like we see Lonzo Ball do um, with a guy like Fox down there on the other end. That could be real, a really good weapon for them. And playmaking wise, as I said, the vision, everything like that is just a, and the, the passing accuracy, just really elite for him. Um, half court wise, the way they could use him more effectively than just stand in either stand in the corner like sometimes they have him do or 
um, run like a more traditional pick and roll. Uh, if they kind of get him moving on some cuts and, you know, across the lane to the elbows, something like that, just get him moving without the ball. I think his passing is best used as like, you know, they get him the ball on a cut and he makes a quick next decision, hits hits the guy in the dunker spot or kicks it out to the open three-point three, uh, three point shooter as the defense collapses. Something like that, a role like that would really suit him. I think the less you can have him dribble in the half court, kind of the better. Um, because like his real strength is making quick decisions with the ball. Uh, Davion Mitchell, next guy I want to talk about. I like him a lot more than I thought I would. Um, I did. I was not a believer. I'm fully, fully willing to admit that I did not believe that this would work out as a pick. I just, I didn't see it from a guy who had kind of had a fluky three point shooting year, but historically hadn't been that very, very good from the three point line. Um, and you know, at his height, six foot. <laughs> I just didn't see the, him being an elite defender, um, but the defense is as advertised. You know, he is a very, very good defender, even as a rookie, and they're giving him the defensive matchups of like the Dame Lillers and, and whatnot when he comes in off the bench. Uh, off dribble, you know, stuff I think is ahead of schedule for him. Um, yeah, I mean, he can get to the basket a little bit here and there, and especially, you know, going against the opposing team's second unit. I think it's been... I think it's been ahead of schedule for him. It, it's looked pretty good. Shooting is still kind of a question mark for him. I mean, he's made some shots. He's not made some shots. I mean, it's uh, we were worried it wouldn't be great, and it hasn't been great, but it also hasn't been bad. It's not been a disaster like some people feared, including myself. Um, so, yeah, he, he's been really solid for them. I like him as a third guard, especially with Halliburton and Fox. Um, I don't ever see him – at least on this roster as a starting point guard, I, I think it would be tough to make him like a franchise level point guard. So I kind of see him always as a, in, in a bench role or kind of a, as a limited starter, like, a, I don't know, Patrick Beverly or something when things were going really great with him. I think he could be better than Beverly, but as far as being like a all-star level point guard I just I don't see it happening I don't think when they drafted him they expected him to be at that level either but he's an interesting player and with the guards they already have I think you know this this could really be really special for them guard wise uh Buddy Heald um you know I I've been really impressed with him he's kind of instant offense off of the bench for them um some shot selection issues he takes some really bad three pointers here and there but i mean he can get to the basket he obviously shoots the three very well just you know some some of the contested shots you'd rather him not take um unfortunately for him i think it's he's kind of the odd man out here it's to, he don't really want him playing small forward like he kind of has to with this group with three all guards that they have a high investment in whether it be monetary pick wise or both um, with Mitchell Halliburton and Fox, those were all lottery picks, recent lottery picks, and they want to get those guys a lot of minutes. So healed, you know, not well suited for the small forward. So he's just kind of the odd man out, unfortunately. Um, I do want to talk about the Lakers thing. Um, because, you know, they were – the Kings, as far as I've heard, thought that was a done deal. Buddy healed to the Lakers for Kuzma and Montrez Harrell. I think in hindsight, both teams would have been made a lot better by that trade than the Russell Westbrook um, for Lakers bench pieces. But – um, I think if they had Kuzma instead of Heald, I think the roster would make a lot more sense. But right now they have Heald. I think he's the odd odd man out. They can hold on to him. He's not on a super expensive contract. Um, but in terms of like a long-term fit, I just don't see that it, it's going to make sense if you're going to commit to Davion Mitchell, Halliburton, and Fox. Um, Rashawn Holmes, I, I don't really have a lot to say, you know, Double double guy, 14 points, gets a block here and there. Um, didn't see him. He was out for the Portland game and, and the Lakers game. So haven't seen a ton of him. So I, I don't really have a ton to say about him. I like him, but like I don't think in terms of like he's not a needle mover, I don't think, for them at least. Um, I think you'd feel a lot better if he was coming off of the bench, but as a starter, he's solid enough. He's not like the weak spot. He's not the problem with this team by any means. Uh Harrison Barnes. Really good three and D wing. If they could get another guy with a skill set similar to Harrison Barnes, um, I think they're I think they're a real team. I think they're a real threat to make the playoffs. Um, as it stands now, they're running Mo Harkless um, alongside Barnes, 
as their their wing tandem. It, uh, Mo Harkless is just terrible. <laughs> I I was really hopeful for him with the Heat last year, but it just never really happened. It's just it's not it's just not going to happen for him, unfortunately. I don't think. <laughs> and um, yeah, you know, I'd feel a lot better if there was another if they could clone Harrison Barnes and start both of them, but. Uh, obviously we can't do that. So yeah, I, I don't know. It's fine. Um, Marvin Bagley. I'm finally glad to see him getting some playing time under Gentry. Uh, what was Luke Walton doing here? Like the last couple of games, uh, Bagley has looked really good. Um, obviously, you know, if you take out the context of where he was drafted, I think he can be a really solid player. I think it's going to be tough for him to kind of in his career, he's always going to be the guy that was taken ahead of Luka Doncic. Um, which is tough, but I, I, what, like Luke Walton wasn't playing this guy and it's so weird. Um, kind of the way they're using him now is weird too. Like it, it seems like Gentry is hesitant to go with him as the lone big guy. Like he's running him with Alex Len or Tristan Thompson. And it's a weird fit. Cause like Bagley will end up having to guard like a perimeter player. Like they had him on LeBron James in the Lakers game for like, weird oddly long stretches of the game and that was just kind of the only place he could guard somebody with some of the Laker lineups later he ended up on Mello when they brought Mello back in but still to just like kind of commit him to being like a perimeter defender is kind of strange um I think you could get away with him at the five uh Gentry had this lineup that was just a complete disaster they ran Harkless Len and Bagley and it just looked terrible um yeah, I think Bagley, maybe not as a starting center, but like in a pinch or like in spot minutes here and there as a stretch five, I think it could be really good. He, you know, I kind of mentioned him being forced onto perimeter players. He can defend the perimeter pretty well. I just don't think that's the place that you want to start him at is defending LeBron James on the perimeter. I think that's, I think that's a tough ask for him. Um, but you know, he attacks the glass, you know, as well as anybody on their roster. Um, kind of the a theme I've seen them, you know, have, at least in the games that I've watched, is they've struggled on the glass. It's not been super great. Um, so if they're going to commit, if they're not going to ever be a good rebounding team, even if they have two bigs on the court, why not just commit to not being a good rebounding team and just be athletic and quick? Um, Bagley can hold it down on the glass well enough. Um and with the, the small lineups that they run with their guards, they're, they're just never going to be a good rebounding team, so who cares? Um, Bagley can beat some people off the dribble, especially if you put him at the five and he's got some slow lumbering center on him. He can take some guys off the dribble. He could shoot the three. He had a couple of big ones in the Lakers game. Um, yeah, he's honestly a decent passer. Um, you know, the playmaking stuff, he, he's, got, he's got some nice passes. It could be really fun. Um, to see him at the five. I hope they go to that. I haven't really seen them do it yet, but hopefully Gentry, you know, gets the film and sees that that could be a real weapon for them. Um, I would love to see a Fox Halliburton healed uh, Harrison Barnes and Bagley lineup. I think that could be really fun. It could be really difficult to keep up with the athleticism of that lineup. And if they can get some stops, you know, attacking on the fast break, it, particularly with Halliburton's playmaking, that could be, that could be really great. Um, rest of the roster, I don't really feel strongly about one way or the other. Just because I didn't mention that I liked somebody doesn't mean that I hate them. Um, Alex Len, I don't really like him very much. <laughs> he's uh, he's fine, but like as a backup center, they were starting him the last couple of games with Holmes out. It, it didn't look good. Um, Tristan Thompson, I, he kind of just does a little bit too much sometimes. Like he's, he dribbles the ball way more than you would like, and it's just – I, I don't know. He still he can still get on the glass, so that's good. But yeah, the rest of the roster I don't really feel too strongly about. But the guys that I mentioned, I feel good about. And I think if they kind of redefine the roles and maybe make an ac the odd acquisition here and there, they they really need some wing help and maybe some center help. Um, I'm not committed to that one as much as the wing help. They really need to get another wing in there. Mo Harkless has no business on an NBA court. So if they can get that sorted out, I think they could easily make a push for the playoffs this year.